Well, good morning and welcome to worship today. We are glad that you're here as we celebrate Palm Sunday together. It's a little bit different way of celebrating it. Uh, not quite the, uh, the usual uh, parade and fanfare of palm leaves and uh, singing our praises that we normally have on a, a worship service when we're together. Uh, but I think that we have an opportunity here to praise God and to celebrate our King in some new ways. Uh, today begins our journey towards Easter. Uh, and Holy Week, and uh, we hope that you'll join us again in some different ways in this week ahead. On Thursday night, we will have our 7 o'clock uh, Monday Thursday uh, service, and, uh, and we will uh, not be able to celebrate communion together, uh, but we will be able to remember Christ's final night with his disciples. Uh, Good Friday will be a little bit different. We'll have um, our 7 o'clock service. Uh, you can watch that on Facebook as well. But we're also breaking those reflections up throughout the day. And so starting at about noon or so on our Facebook page, every hour there will be a different reflection as we journey through Good Friday together. And then, of course, Easter Sunday, we'll be looking forward to gathering again. Uh, come join us on our Facebook page as we celebrate uh, the resurrection and our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. So uh, let us prepare our hearts to worship him. So today, as we gather, we begin our journey through Holy Week. Let us lift our hearts and our voices in praise to our King, our Messiah, and our God. Let us sing to our King today. Long for you. Cause 
when we see you, we we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all. to prepare for the holiest of weeks. This week, we will journey through praise. As we travel through betrayal and death, may we cradle hope deep in our hearts. Jesus, lead us through this week. May we follow you. You set aside all power, glory, and might. You came and you modeled humility and you modeled obedience for all of us. You are Hosanna. You are bringing the kingdom to us. You offer us the life we long for. Oh Lord, be the peace that we need at this time. May we be able to rest in you and declare that it is well with our soul, even now, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.
As dawn broke, he arose. Jesus was coming for his kingdom. Coming to save man from sin. Coming to crush the hold of death from within. Coming so man could live with him forever. But man's heart did not desire his saving grace. He came humbly on the unbroken foal of a donkey. As he entered the city, the people rejoiced, but Jesus wept. You see, the crowds didn't want forgiveness and mercy. They desired an earthly victory. They followed Jesus for misguided reasons. They followed his works, but denied the freedom in his words. He came for a spiritual kingdom, not of earth, but the kingdom of heaven. And though legions of angels knelt before him, he did not come to wage war on the Romans, but to wage war on religion. That cancerous hypocrisy driven by pride, which concluded that the sinner should be shamed and excluded. But these very sinners were the purpose of his crucifixion. Make no mistake, Jesus did not die a victim. He was instead the willing sacrifice for our sin. 
We worship Jesus today, not because of what he may do for us, but because of who he is to us, our King, our Messiah, and our God, who brought his kingdom through a cross, the heavy cross that pointed to a promise, a revelation that one day will stand with every nation, tribe, and language. Palm branches lifted high, one voice united in a deafening cry, salvation belongs to our God. Jesus is here. His kingdom is here. Today, as we turn to our time in God's Word, we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Luke. If you've got your Bibles there and want to follow along, we're in Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 28. After Jesus had said this, He went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when He had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, He sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as He had told them. Now as they were untying the colt, its owners came and asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks along the road. And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Let's pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered together be acceptable and worthy in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. There is an interesting connection between war and peace. Uh, often we define peace as being the absence of war. So if we look at a region and there's no violent conflict happening, we say that there is peace there. Uh, in fact, we often see that peace is the result of war. Uh, for instance, if an army marches into a peaceful land and takes it over, typically it's by a violent uh, uh, um, uh, re reply to that in, in which we take that peace back. Uh, often war uh, beats back the enemies and ushers in peace once more. In fact, some would say uh, that the threat of war actually causes peace. For instance, nations build up their arsenals, and every now and then uh, 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 a nation will kind of flex its military muscle a little bit just to let the rest of the world know, don't mess with us, and that maintains some kind of peace in doing that. So there's this interesting connection between peace and war. I'm not sure all of us would agree with that definition. Uh, many of us would uh, probably do better to, to define peace uh, in some way other than the absence of war, maybe as something else altogether, um, and uh, we'll get there. But as we look in the world around us, often this is the way we see war and peace playing out. And this isn't just something that we see in our own generation. This is something we've seen in generations that have gone past as well. So when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, His people desperately crave peace. They are under the power of the Roman Empire. They are being oppressed by the Roman Empire. They hate the Roman Empire, and they want to get rid of it. They want peace, and for them, what peace looks like is freedom. What it looks like for them is a violent overthrow of their oppressors. And so this is what they think that Jesus is coming to bring them as He rides victoriously into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. It makes sense uh, uh, that they saw it this way. After all, Rome had taken power by military conquest. Uh, Jerusalem had been just one of the, 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 the many victims of uh, the Pax Romana, where uh, Roman uh, interests had been spread throughout all the, the known world. Most of the known world had been conquered by Rome and uh, now was subjected to its rule. 
And so as Israel thought of what freedom and peace would look like for them, they saw it as a violent response to that, an overthrow of the Roman government so that they might once again find peace and freedom in their own land. Now, Jesus came as the Prince of Peace, right? Uh, We see that in the prophet Isaiah. And and, and even though peace is the descriptive that's used for him, uh, they figure this is probably the one that's going to get this done. He's probably the one that's going to get this done started, right? And as we read through the gospel accounts of Palm Sunday, there's a lot of details that are contained in this gospel and the other gospels as well. And part of the reason why they give so much detail about this occurrence is because we are watching prophecy uh, being fulfilled, unfolding before our eyes as we read this passage of Scripture. Many of the, uh, these prophecies, many of these details are connecting Jesus with the, the Davidic rule or the Davidic dynasty that had happened so many generations before, kind of the, the high life of, the, of, the, uh, of, of Israel's history. And so things like the palm branch, which were a, a nationalistic symbol for them, or, or even riding on the donkey, all these things connected Jesus to King David. And Jesus was doing this intentionally. Jesus was trying uh, to make them understand that He was the fulfillment uh, of all of these prophecies. He was the coming Messiah. They had been waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah was here. And they caught on. They recognized this. They celebrated Him as King. They celebrated that He was coming now to fulfill all of these uh, prophecies regarding the Messiah. Now, this was Passover week. Uh, that they were moving into. And and Passover was always a time of kind of a nationalistic fervor anyway, because you remember what happened at the Passover, right? Israel was a a slave in the land of Egypt, and God showed up in power and might and overthrew the power of Egypt and set His people free so that they could become a a free and, uh, and a peaceful nation of their own. So, as Passover was coming, many of them were wondering in their minds, can God do this same thing again? Is now when it's going to happen? The Messiah is coming. Is the Messiah going to lead us into peace again? And again, in their mind, what they thought of as peace was a violent military overthrow of their enemies. That's the Messiah that they were expecting. But I'm not sure they got what they expected when Jesus came. Jesus wasn't coming to overthrow their enemy in the way that they expected. Jesus was coming to make peace in a way that was completely different than what they expected. So, what did it mean for Jesus to make peace as He came? Well, I think we have to come back to that definition of peace because I'm not sure it's adequate for us to say that peace is merely the absence of war. Or uh, if you consider it more broadly in terms of our relationships, peace is not merely the absence of conflict. We don't say that we have peace in a relationship just because we're not currently fighting over something, right? So what if peace is not merely the absence of something But what if peace is actually something of substance in and of itself? What if peace, like light, is the true reality, and and conflict and war, like darkness, are merely the absence of what is true, the absence of peace? I think we'll find that peace is truly something in and of itself. Peace is found in harmony and unity and connection with God and with others. And this was the kind of peace that Jesus was going to bring to His people. Now, again, that may not have been what many of them expected. Many of them wanted something different from Him. And by the end of this week, we'll see that many of the crowds had turned their backs on Jesus. We'll get to that on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. The crowds realized that Jesus wasn't going to be the one to get them there. And so instead, they cried for the release of Barabbas, who was most likely a zealot and probably a more likely candidate to lead them in battle. But even in our story here today, there's already signs that not everybody is on the same page. We see that as we continue uh, our reading. We're just picking up right at verse 39 here. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, "'Teacher, order your disciples to stop.' And he answered them, "'I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would shout out.' Now, as he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, "'If you even you had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. 
Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. And then he entered the temple, began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, and leaders of the people kept looking for a way to kill him, but they did not find anything that they could do, for all the people were spellbound by what they heard. So even here as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, the Pharisees already realized that something was wrong. The Pharisees uh, were respected uh, leaders among uh, the religious leaders of their day, and uh, they told Jesus, stop the crowd, stop your disciples from saying these things. Now, either uh, they thought that Jesus wasn't really the Messiah, or they recognized that this situation was dangerous, that as Jesus rode into town in this way with all the crowds crying out what they were crying out, that this was a dangerous situation and Rome would not tolerate it. Now, you notice that the Pharisees did not say anything to the crowds. It's as if they already knew that the crowds were caught up, swept up in this movement that was happening here. So they said it to Jesus, hoping that Jesus might recognize uh, the dangerous nature of the situation that he was causing. Now, Jesus understood it perfectly clear, but Jesus also knew that the time for silence and the time for secrecy was over. He had fully embraced the call of His Father in His life. He had fully embraced the role that God had called Him to, and He was stepping into that every step of the way as He processed into Jerusalem. But He did also understand the threat. He did understand what could happen if this got out of hand. We see in this moment here, Jesus looks out over Jerusalem, uh, this, uh, the, the shouting of the crowds and what is starting to build up to uh, what, what probably felt like a revolt there as they embraced Him as King, and He recognized that this kind of fervor would lead to their own destruction. He realized that it was exactly this kind of mentality uh, that would lead them to the destruction of Jerusalem. What He's referring to here is the siege of Jerusalem, which happened 40 years later. Uh, he knew that his people would continue to fight and rise up for their freedom, and he knew that Rome would continue to crack down on any kind of uprising as it happened, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, uh, Israel, uh, apparently 40 years later, they found another Messiah who would lead them in battle. Uh, Rome brought all of the weight of their military might upon the city, and it was completely destroyed. The city was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Their people were destroyed. And the, the, the historians who were writing in that day wrote of an absolutely horrific scene that happened in the siege of Jerusalem. Jesus knew that the path that they wanted to go, that, that they were wanting Him to lead them into, would only lead to their destruction. They could not find peace in that way. They would not find freedom in that way. And so He came to offer a better way. He came to offer a different kind of peace, and it broke His heart to see them reject it. It broke His heart to know that it would not make a difference to them. Now, for someone who is seeking peace, Jesus' uh, visit to Jerusalem this time was a little bit violent, uh, if you read about it. He went into the temple and began throwing tables over. We read the other Gospels that He formed a whip out of some cords and began to drive the animals and even the people out of the temple. So what got into Jesus at this time? What, what exactly was His issue as He began turning tables over in the temple grounds? Well, Jesus' frustration was that this temple, this very temple system that was meant to connect people with God, that was meant to reach out to all nations and bring them into the glory of God, they were not only doing their job poorly, but they were actually taking advantage of the very people who were coming to seek God. The, the courtyard that he was in was the courtyard of the Gentiles. For Gentile converts, this was as close as they could get to God. This is as close as they could get to the temple to worship God. And that courtyard had become a circus. It had become a, 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 a stockyard with, with, with animals and money changers. It had become a marketplace, a place where they could not seek God in prayer. And not only that, but these, uh, the money changers and the people selling the animals for sacrifices, they were, they're ripping everyone off, knowing that this was the only place where they could do these transactions and, and, and this kind of business. 
So Jesus had had it. He was going to clear this place out so that the people could once again seek God here, once again seek God here. And so he began turning over these tables. You know, God was always more concerned with the heart of his people, with the holiness of his people, than he was with the wickedness in the world around. He always began with his people. It, it, scripture uh, tells us that judgment begins with the house of the Lord. He knew that it was his people that were going to be the best chance of reaching the rest of the world. And if they weren't getting it right, then this wasn't going to happen. And so that's why this, this, this rage, this fire of God was in Jesus uh, to, to turn things around. And I think this is something good for us to take to heart. Because honestly, sometimes we get this feeling that we want Jesus to come so he can straighten out the world. So he could whip the world into shape, right? Because that's where all the problems are. They're out there in the world. And I think in reality, when Jesus comes to deliver, when Jesus comes to bring redemption, Jesus begins right here. Jesus begins right here. Jesus begins among his people, right? Because again, Jesus is more concerned about the heart of his own people, about the state of their hearts and lives, than he is about the wickedness of people that don't even know God yet. And so he would start right here in our midst, right here in our hearts, and begin flipping tables over, right? Upending parts of our life in order to try to bring, bring us around, and I wonder what kind of things would he find fault with in our lives, in our church? I wonder whether he would step into the church, our churches today. percentage of people in the community that call themselves Christians, they call themselves by my name, and yet when it comes to an actual engagement in, in things as simple as worship or service or even reaching out, the people are nowhere to be found. What's going on here? And why is it that so often the churches seem to be more consumed with keeping people happy on the inside than reaching out to people on the outside? I wonder if those would be some tables that Jesus would flip over in our lives. I wonder if Jesus would have some things to say about our relationship with the culture around us. Would He applaud us for our efforts to kind of stem the tide in society on, on issues like human sexuality and same-sex marriage? Would He applaud us for not adopting the culture around us? Or would he point out that really already there was no distinguishable difference in the lives of the average Christian when it came to things like human sexuality, when it came to premarital sex or cohabitation or pornography use or infidelity? Would he point out the fact that all of those things have just been absorbed by Christianity and seem to happen at the same rate as the rest of the world? Would he applaud us for trying to uphold the institution of marriage or would he point out that divorces are happening just as often among the Christians, those that call ourselves by His name. What kind of tables would He flip over in our lives and in the church to get our attention? Now, He started with money, right? And so maybe He would go to money as well. Maybe He would say, it's so important to you to have a, a, a literal interpretation of Scripture, and yet when it comes to that word tithe, you're not always as literal about that one, are you? You, you, you tend to, to use a spiritual interpretation of that word, something that means whatever's left over or whatever I feel like giving. What tables would Jesus flip over in our lives? This is the way that Jesus brings peace. We don't understand it. We don't necessarily appreciate it. We don't always like it when Jesus starts to meddle within our lives. And yet, this is the way Jesus brings peace. Now, the, um, the Pharisees and the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they didn't appreciate what Jesus was doing. He was calling them to repentance and confession, and yet they rejected him. To them, he was a threat to their way of life and to their way of doing ministry. To them, he was a threat. He was going to break down the, the wrath of the Roman Empire upon them, and so they rejected Jesus. I wonder if we often respond the same way when Jesus gets into our life, starts flipping over those tables of those things that are important within our own hearts or that we think are important. How do we respond to that? Do we turn our backs on Jesus as well? Do we take those as an invitation to own up to our sin and our brokenness, to confess and to repent? Because it's when we respond in that way that we receive the grace of God, that we receive forgiveness and reconciliation. That's the way that we experience peace within our lives. When we turn away from those other things that are at war with God, 
and we embrace the work that He wants to do within us. I think that's the best way of understanding the way that Jesus makes peace within us. He points out the things that are at war in our lives with God's purposes, and He calls on us to walk away from them, to end those battles, to choose God over all of those petty things within our life. And then we can experience peace in a much more deep and profound way. We can experience a harmony with God, an intimacy with God, a greater connection with God. And when we experience that kind of connection with God, that just overflows into our relationships with others, and we find peace in our relationship with other people. That's the way we make peace. Peace is not something that's imposed upon a system or imposed on people from the outside. It's not something that God forces upon us. It's actually something that begins within us and grows and thrives and multiplies. And so it begins with me. It begins with you. It begins with all of us to take that invitation from Christ as He gets into our life and meddles just a little bit, as I'm sure He's doing today. That's an invitation for us to say, those things that are at war with God's purposes in my life, I set them aside because I seek something far greater than those things. Will we embrace God's grace through confession, repentance, and receive this gift of reconciliation with God? We grow in our peace with God. And that can't help but affect our relationship with other people, right? Right? Because when we experience peace with God, God begins to also meddle in our relationships as well, right? God begins to point out our flaws and our failures and the way we relate to other people, and He can bring healing and wholeness there as well. We can experience peace not just in an absence of conflict, in that we're no longer fighting with other people, but He invites true unity, true intimacy, true harmony with other people. And we experience that in relationships that grows in the way we experience that as the body of Christ. When we experience that as the body of Christ, it begins to grow in the way we experience that same peace as a community and as a nation. And ultimately, the world itself can come to understand the peace of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your gift of peace. God, we don't always appreciate the way that you're going to accomplish that in our lives. God, we, we think it should be so much easier, something you could just force on us, make it happen, and, and, and make all these other things go away, Lord. But, uh, Lord, sometimes you walk us through some painful moments when we reflect on who we are, who we've been, what we've become, and more importantly, who you're inviting us to be. So, Lord, do that holy work within our hearts. Do that work of transformation that we might experience deep and abiding peace with you. Extend that so that we might experience that same peace with others as well. Lord, it's through those relationships, through that, through that harmony, intimacy we have with one another. It's through those things that you hope to reach the world around us. And I think that's why you get so frustrated with our brokenness. Because it's disrupting your plans to reach others. And so, Lord, bring alignment to our hearts today. Draw us into unity with yourself and others so that we might see your peace spread throughout the world. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Since it is the first Sunday of the month, we were meant to gather at this table together to receive the sacrament of communion. There's a lot of things we can do through the camera and the internet. Communion isn't one of those things. We can worship together. We can pray together. We can connect with one another. We can do Bible study. We found this in the last few weeks. We can do Bible study. We can do small groups. We can do all these things through the camera, but we can't gather at the table together in quite the way that God desires for us to. I know there's churches out there that are experimenting with online communion, and honestly, I just can't go there. I understand the hunger. I understand the desire for God's grace made manifest in a, in a special way that comes from this table. But honestly, that hunger shouldn't lead us into practices that would diminish the practice in our own eyes. 
I think it's worth the wait. I think we lean into that hunger. We acknowledge how much we need it, and we look forward to that day when we can get together again and we can celebrate, celebrate around this table and receive God's grace in a new way. So today I'd like to invite you to join with me uh, in a prayer that comes out of the Book of Common Prayer from the Anglican Church. It's a, a, a prayer of spiritual communion. Will you join with me in lifting up our desire to be in full communion with God and to receive the gift of His grace? I think you'll find the words on your screen. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Well, now is the time when we have typically done our our offering, and so at this time, I'd like to invite you to take some time, uh, just right where you are, to reflect on the way that God is working in your life, the way that God wants to work in your life, and uh, the ways that we can offer our hearts up to God in a new way today.
during this time that Jesus, the king who rode into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, is still the king of kings, the king of all the other kings on this earth. As we close our time of worship today, I invite you to join us in this song, which declares God's faithfulness to us. We can rest in God now and rest in the peace he offers us that surpasses our own understanding when we remember his great faithfulness to us.
Today we have met with the Prince of Peace. Today he reminds us of that gift of restoration and peace that he offers each one of us. Let us go now as ambassadors of that peace into the world. and Spread it out in whatever way God calls you to this week. Go now, may the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now. Go in peace. Thank you.